Dublin Fire and Ambulance. What's the address of the emergency here, please? It's a fire, building on fire. Is everyone out there, do you know? Well, I don't know. It sounds as if it's, oh, they said it's sparking, banging and... Okay, so you just make sure you're safe out there, okay? What floor is it on, can you see? I can only see that the odd flames coming up through the roof now. It's through the roof, is it? Yeah. It's the early hours of the morning, and a crew is en route to a large fire at an industrial premises in West Dublin. If they stand any chance of defeating this blaze, station officer Stephen Wiley knows they're going to need backup. Do you require any additional appliances at the moment? Uh, I would make pumps for and aerial appliance run over. I'm 70 mil holes made down from here. That. District Officer Barney Mulhall has been called out to the scene. It's up to S.O. Wiley and him to decide on the best plan of attack. It's huge. You can't all the way back now. Barney's going to go in next door. Yeah. Um, I don't know why you want to get us another couple of pumps to prevent it. What we have it here at the moment, we can cope with that. I'm just afraid of it. It's going to go that way and it's going to go that way. Yeah. And I don't think we'd have enough pumps to contain it. It's no. huge. You're in charge of sector one. Yeah. You alright in that branch? Did you see him come to you? Yeah, no, I'm not you sure? Yeah. When you pull up to an industrial unit, you don't know what's in there. Depending what it is, it may have workshops, it may have gas cylinders, it may store flammable liquids or, or dangerous substances. There may be chemicals in there. So all of those are hazards. So you need to approach very, very carefully. Now, move back. Sarah, come out. Come out! Come out! Come out! Come out! Out! That one down there looks okay. I'm going to get him to twin up to you. Okay. So well, I tell you, if the TL comes, yeah, you're going to probably be feeding him. Industrial fires, generally uh, water supplies, you normally have to supplement them because if you're dealing with a large structure, you need lots of volumes of water. And an industrial estate may have one ring main going around. The more water you take from that, you know, the more you're drawing on it and the weaker it's going to get. So you need to find uh, an alternative water supply somewhere else to supplement that. So Tom reckons he's a half decent supply in the hospital. Yeah. So do you want them? Them to go into the hospital. Okay, am I telling them or you telling them? With an aerial appliance now in position, the fire is being attacked from all angles. Mulhall and Wiley continue to investigate further. The next stage of the operation is to see if they can gain access deep inside. That's, that's offices. That looks like offices, the fire is there. Yeah. You can hear the burning. Yeah. yeah. If you could in through here, and if you can get a line in there from this end. After the initial defensive attack, firefighters will be ordered into the building in pairs with an inbreeding apparatus to go in and start knocking down the various pockets of fire that are in there um, so as we can actually bring the fire to a close. With the fire being tackled inside and out, the blaze is soon brought under control. For the firefighters, it's now all about damage limitation. Remember, that's a commercial building, so the less damage caused may mean the shorter amount of time it is closed, the shorter amount of time that people are out of work. So it's vital we bring the incident to a close as early as we can. However, the officer must always remember that these are commercial buildings with no life risk involved, and we certainly don't want to put a firefighter's life at risk for bricks and mortar. We want everybody going home safe at the end of the shift. It's the summer of 2014, and for firefighter Michael Carton, who's based in Blanchestown Fire Station, that means inter-county hurling is in full swing. Carton is one of the cornerstones of the resurgent Dublin team. My dad played for Dublin for 17 years, so if we were dragged all around Dublin and Ireland watching him play, you know, that was the first present I was ever given was a hurl when I was born, so I suppose I'd no option in the matter. It's just been part and parcel of, of growing up. I was never out on the road without a hurl in my hand, so... Um, it's just something I've grown up playing and love it. 
It's been a tough summer for Carton and the Dubs. In 2013, they reached the All-Ireland semi-final. But so far this year, their form has failed to hit the same level, and they've just come off the back of a heavy defeat. So how do you feel this year compared to last year? Ah, good. It's been a bit of a mixed bag so far, to be honest. So, it's a great win against Wexford. And then they've went on and done so well, and we sort of dropped off the boil by getting hammered by Kenny that time. So, just bad everywhere, everywhere. So, we weren't at the races. They wanted the ball more, they fought for the ball harder. You have a lot more to offer anyway than you were showing in that. This is a good performance guy. against Tip, and you're back on, on track. The whole summer is now riding on Dublin's upcoming match against Tipperary. If they lose, it will be the end of their season. For Carton, it means utilising every second of his downtime. When he can grab a quiet moment, he heads straight to the racquetball alley adjoining the station to work on his touch. The preparation that goes in every year is unbelievably tough. Like, I suppose we went back with Dublin in November and been training four days a week since. It's a good nine-month season. Really, you're, you're looking at to, to win all Ireland, and the teams have to put that in, and we've been putting it in every year for the last six years, so um, it means everything to us. I'd be one of the senior statesmen on the team, and pushing 30 this year, it's getting harder and harder every year, so I will be giving it everything to, and pushing the team on to be on belief to, on Sunday to win that game, you know? Pressure is a fact of life in both firefighting and intercounty hurling. And for Carton, the similarities don't end there. Oh, it's very like being in a dressing room here all day. <laughs> like, there's a, a lot of stick being thrown around and it's good, good, good crack. It's the same in a dressing room, everyone will be having a bit of crack and a bit of banter. <laughs> Grab any of these, Kevo. But you're going to be prepared for Sunday anyway, make a good dinners like that anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to show Ant Anthony <laughs> Daly this. <laughs> what was wrong with you on Sunday? You want to lift the plate? There's huge similarities between playing within the Dublin team and being in the fire brigade. It's the same, once the whistle goes in a match, you just turn it on. Everybody's the same, and once the bells go here in the station, you could be having a bit of crack or having a cup of tea or doing your duties, and you just switch it, switch to fire brigade mode then at that stage. Sunday's match against Tipperary may loom large in his mind, but there is plenty of work to be done in the meantime. Every time the bell goes, you get that little buzz, you know? You know, you don't know what you're going to, and there's that bit of excitement there, and, and then if you're running out in front of 50,000 people, how couldn't you get that adrenaline rush? There's huge similarities, but that's, that's what I love being around. It's the environment I enjoy. Hello, Fire and Ivan Service. Uh, a young mum with two children has just, just collapsed here. Yeah. Is she awake? No. Is she breathing? I can't say. She seems like so she's asleep. Is she sitting up and speaking to you? No, no, she's not. So I take it that she's unconscious still. Just let her rest in the most comfortable position away for help to arrive. If she becomes less awake and vomits quickly, turn her on her side. Carton, as with all Dublin firefighters, is a fully trained paramedic, ready at a moment's notice to put his medical skills to play. That's it, keep your hands down by your side, all right? I know, I know, I know. We just can't move your neck, all right? Don't nod, just say, say yes or no, good woman. She came in to the doctor today with neck and back pain, had a witness collapse, no LOC, still has the neck and back pain. English is very difficult, you know, language barriers. She walked in with neck and back pain? Yeah, okay. and then she fell, hit her head, no LOC. Mm -hmm. So we sat her up, she still has the neck and back pain. She's so taking diaphine this morning for the mm -hmm. pain relief, but no relief whatsoever. Someone mentioned she has, has neck and back pain 10 years, is it? Yeah, uh, intermittently for 10 years, she said. Okay. Any other medical problems? No, not to be no. of. They place the patient on a spinal board as a precaution. The call-out has been straightforward, but that's not always the case. A hurling for me is a release. Like, uh, there is pressure to perform and that, but it's a release from everything. Like When you're in here and you get bad cases, or you go to a bad fire or a bad cardiac arrest, that's serious pressure to, to perform as a work unit. Like, when you talk about pressure on a pitch, 
you just I sort of take that in my stride. Like I enjoy that. That's a different side of life where you can go out and hurl and forget about everything. And that's the way I approach every game. When you see bad things of our job, that's when you're really put to the pin of your collar. When you go into a pitch, the pressure to win is nothing compared to that. You win or you lose, it means everything on the day, but I'll walk away from it a happy man once everyone walks off the pitch healthy. And... See you, man. At the O'Brien Training Centre, today marks the beginning of fire behaviour discipline. It's the first time that Dublin Fire Brigade's new recruits will come face to face with live flames with backdraft potential. Nerves are high among the trainee firefighters. This is what it's all about. For weeks they've been drilled in the proper way to put out a fire, but nothing can prepare them for their first brush with the real thing. Instructor Mark Kiernan knows the recruits are facing a daunting task. The difficulty at this stage is that they still have to more or less overcome their natural tendency to put water at the flame front. What we're trying to teach them is they have to put water where the flame is actually coming from, the origin of the flame. And the whole theory here is that it's to do with droplets of water, it's not to do with a steady stream of water. So the droplets of the water are basically stealing the energy from the fire. The difficulty as well that they have is when they knock back the flame front, they tend to sit and admire their hard work and the flame front's only going to come back at them again. The flame itself is in and around five to 700 degrees. So what we have to do is to overcome their natural fear and to actually advance and keep knocking back the flame front. When they actually get to the seat of the fire, that's when they actually start to extinguish the fire. I suppose the real concern for them as students is once they pass this course, they're then fully qualified. So the first day on fire station, they could end up going to a fire straight away. They know that they have to be on their game. You're going into an environment which is extremely dangerous. You need to have your wits about you. You need to be able to fight the fire quickly and effectively to be able to get in and get back out. The crew from Skerries are responding to reports of a car fire in North County Dublin. Two of the 14 stations within Dublin Fire Brigade's area of operations are crewed on a part-time or retained basis, and Skerries is one of them. These fully trained firefighters could be on call 24 hours a day for two weeks at a time, and their commitment takes priority over their day jobs, family and social life. Once their pagers tell them a call has come in, they have to drop everything and get to the station within three or four minutes to respond to cases such as these. Hello, fire number. I've just got a phone call from my wife. She's in the car heading to scary smoke coming out of the car. And the car's on fire, isn't it? There's a lot of smoke coming out of the dash. You have to get out of the smoke. Well, there's a car on fire. Is it on the other cars? Well, there's a car driving up past it. Like, somebody want to go down and stop the car so right. it's up the road. Well, look, we're on the way there, OK? Car fires are very detrimental to your health. There are literally several thousand chemicals that come off the, the smoke of a, of a car fire. It's essential that the firefighters wear BA if they're going anywhere near it at all. Smoke is only one of the many dangers associated with car fires. From tires and petrol tanks to even airbags, 
The explosive risks in battling these blazes means that the firefighters must proceed with caution. You'll see firefighters approaching a car, mostly always side on. Rarely will they go to a car from the back. The hydraulic rams within the tailgates of the doors can expand and, and, and burst, and those rams can actually shoot like a missile. And I have seen them literally take off down the road. We have to access the bonnet, because if the car isn't fully burnt out, we don't want it reigniting. If it was exposed to a lot of heat, the battery could explode, you know, sending acid everywhere. And so we always isolate the battery. We do always check the boot of a car too, to make sure that there's a, first of all, nothing dangerous in there. Like literally, it could be cans of fuel. We have actually found, on a number of occasions, you know, explosives and firearms and so on. But well, we are actually checking, and it has happened in the past where, you know, we have found a body in the boot of a car. So that's another reason why they have to be checked. Car fires are a regular occurrence for Dublin Fire Brigade to deal with but their frequency doesn't make them any less dangerous. So if you're in your own car and you get a smell of burning or you see smoke starting to come from the engine, immediately just turn off your ignition, take your keys, get out of the car, call the fire brigade and don't go back to the car. Back at the training center, the recruits are about to fight their first fire head on. The heat turns the steel boxes into walk-in ovens. Any exposed skin will burn instantly and jewellery will melt onto the flesh. It's up to 1200 degrees Celsius around the ceiling inside the containers, making it impossible to stand up. The only way to fight the fire is from down low. It's an amazing experience. You're down on your hunkers, unbelievable heat. You're kind of in awe as well because you're looking at these flames over your head and it's like, wow, well, you're a little bit taken back. When you start progressing up through the compartment, you start feeling severe heat, like stress put on you to push it, to push it, to push it, as you're only in now maybe in a minute, two minutes. You need quick reaction. Guys to be uh, like real G'd up to get in, to get in, to get their turn to do it and get out, you know what I mean? And it's a good buzz, like. Right, that's enough, that's enough. Okay. Like, we'll keep an eye on the fire. Keep an eye on the flame. Yeah. This time in, we're actually watching what you see and see with us. You're in at the front, it's all flame. It's in the back of the compartment, it's the gas if you want to tell. We've got to get a flame we can see. It's all still around, look at the flame. You can't pass on that. Okay, yeah. We have done some testing, more or less what our water loss was. The higher levels, we're losing two litres in about a 20 minute burn. Dehydration is going to affect not just their decision making ability, but their ability to perform a physical function. The you know, was good, you chased that fire back down, that was really, really good. Then you got to a point where you're having no effect on the fire at all. At that point, you need to make a decision. Am I going to go with a sweep, or am I going to withdraw to the safer area? That stage, you're drinking upwards of six or seven litres a day. Lunch times are always interesting because with the heat and with the movement, you don't want to eat too much because it can cause you to vomit. And the last thing you want to do is vomit into your BA set. There were times when, yes, I saw stars. There were times when I thought I couldn't go any further. Very dangerous training, but hugely informative, huge learning curve. The controlled fires still burn, but the trainees have withstood the test. As instructor Mark Kiernan knows, today has been a learning experience. A number of points. A door entry, too long between opening the door and getting in there. If we're trying to check the conditions, if we leave it for 10 seconds, the temperature can have changed in 10 <coughs> seconds. We have to be quicker at the door. By and large, everyone on their second entry 
is quicker getting up the container. Just remember, all your decisions are made based on knowledge. It's not guesswork. You must be able to justify every action that you take in that container. And it's based on the conditions that you see. Don't preempt your conditions. Don't guess your conditions before you go in. React to what you see inside. Everybody has got the techniques right at least once. So what we're looking for is consistency. Any questions? No, okay, that's it. Weeknight training at O'Toole's Hurling Club in Darndale. For firefighter Michael Carton, it's part of the rhythm of his life. Memories of the All-Ireland quarter-final against Tipperary are still fresh in his mind. The preparation couldn't have went any better. Everyone was fit and raring to go. Like we were going to the match really optimistic, thinking we're going to get a great performance out of us. For the first 20 minutes, we didn't hurl that great, but there was only a point or two in it. Michael Carton, who's settled in at right half back, and Carton goes route one. We were sort of struggling to keep pace with the game. But they got scores easier than we did. We had to work very hard to get a score. You're clinging on until half time, really, at that stage. Our backs were against the wall, and you didn't want the game to get away from you. That was the big thing. Michael Carton wins the duel with Bonner Mar. Wins the free as well. Yeah, and he's been excellent. He's a player over the last 12 years or so playing with Dublin, but he's been outstanding over the last couple of seasons. He's having a brilliant game again today. They came out of the blocks flying again in the second half, and we needed the scores, you know. And you're trying to battle, and the harder you try, it's a, sorry, you're fumbling, you're, things aren't working out for you, and, and then every score they were getting, the crowd are getting behind them. And the time's running out, there's 15 minutes left, I think, and then there's a score and score and score, and their confidence is up, and ours is rock bottom. You're training since November, week in, week out, and then you're out, like, out of championship, that's your year over. It's pure deflation around, like you're looking at the dressing room, you might have lads in tears. Oh, it's heartbreaking, it is heartbreaking, like. There's no other word I don't to describe it. It means that much. Wallowing it doesn't do any good. Self-pity is just, you, know, you can have it for a day or two, but after that, get rid of it. It's only, it, it is a game at the end of the day. It definitely helps being in the fire brigade, because it's e it easily put losing the match into perspective. Like you're going into the house and there's devastation within the family of, of a death and then you're trying to compare that to losing a match in Crow Park. Like there's no comparison, you know, and that's where I'd have that bit of perspective. It's only, it, it is a game at the end of the day. If you're able to keep up with the young lads and you're hurling well, I don't think there's any reason why you should leave, you know. I'd love to go back next year though. The hunger's still there.